Welcome to the Israel Bible Podcast. My name is Cindy Parker. I am an author, a speaker, and the professor of Holy Land Studies at the Israel Bible Center. I am passionate about reading the Bible in the physical, historical, and cultural context of its day, and I love having geeky conversations with people about new things. In this podcast, I'd like to invite you to join me as I sit down each week with other faculty members of IBC to discover new aspects of the Bible. These are some of my favorite dialogues because as a modern audience reading an ancient text, we know that the Bible does not need to be rewritten, but it needs to be reread. Today, we get to listen in on a roundtable talk between Dr. Yeshia Gruber and Dr. Mark Goodacre. The talk is titled, Gospels Real and Imagined. Dr. Mark Goodacre is the Francis Hill Fox Professor of Religious Studies at Duke University. He has an excellent podcast called NT Pod, which is about the New Testament and Christian origins. Through his podcast and several of his books, Dr. Goodacre gets people curious about what the Christian community, or even the academic one, views as fact. Dr. Goodacre challenges some of those ideas and gets people to investigate. Like what, you may ask? Well, let's start with two particular questions, shall we? Number one, was Jesus a carpenter? And number two, was Mary Magdalene a prostitute? Lean in and enjoy the conversation. Once upon a time, I had the idea of putting together a book of famous fallacies or, or myths about Christian origins. And one of those would be Jesus was a carpenter. I mean, it, it's not it's not completely wrong, um, but it's but it, it's it's one of those things which is far too specific. Mark six three he's described as a tectone and that basically means someone who works with material someone who works with his hands uh, and i think probably our best english translation is something like handyman something like that so you know he he might have worked with bricks metal wood all sorts they they didn't sort of um parse it out quite so clearly into carpenters and metal workers and builders and so on i do think that one of the things that energizes me in my scholarship is asking questions about things we think we know. I, I always, I mean, it, it's for some people, they hear the word consensus and they think, oh, I better believe that. I better go for that. I'm kind of the opposite from that. I hear the word consensus and I think, right, let's see if there's anything to challenge here. You know, so that, that's part of the way that I think. The Mary Magdalene thing in particular, actually, now, now it is a consensus in scholarship that Mary Magdalene was not a sex worker. There's simply no evidence for that whatsoever in the New Testament or other early Christian texts. And um, I think it's one of the real victories of feminist scholarship on the New Testament that it is now accepted that she has been done a grave injustice by history in being called a prostitute. And uh, some New Testament scholars have, you know, have used even worse words uh, for her, but um, but yes, it, it's a it, it is a complete fallacy. Where did it come from? I, I think it comes from the oldest game in the book, which is you've got four gospels. What do you do when you've got four gospels? Well, you either do what New Testament scholars do and contrast them with one another, or you do with what most Christians have done through history and you harmonise them. And if you start harmonising you quickly end up with Mary Magdalene becoming the woman in Luke 7, 36 to 50, who is described as a sinner with long hair. And people assume that that woman is some kind of sex worker. When she is conflated with Mary Magdalene, that's your route into her as this, her as this, this repentant sinner. And, and I think there's just one other side to it, which is that, Hey, I'm, I, I'm a big lover of Jesus films uh, and analyzing Jesus films. And the thing is, the story of the repentant prostitute is a powerful story. And people want that story. And 
when you have an attractive story, quite often what you want is a name to attach to that story. So, but, but it does the historical Mary Magdalene a uh, grave injustice. That's the problem with it. Ah, I so agree. And I am maybe not as generous as Dr. Goodacre is when it comes to some of those Jesus films, primarily because they always get the geography so massively incorrect, and that just distracts me to no end, and I can't ever get through the film. In the Roundtable Talk, you will also hear Dr. Gruber and Dr. Goodacre discuss the question, did Jesus have a wife? Along with what to do with all these arguments from silence. Okay, now this brings up a whole other interesting set of conversations. Dr. Goodacre argues against the existence of Q, which is the theoretical text that scholars suggest was the primary source for the Synoptic Gospels. But then people will retort that aren't his points an argument from silence? So how does he respond to that? I say it's not. What it is, it's an argument about the silence. What it's saying is, given that we don't have any manuscript evidence for Q, given that we don't have any citational evidence for Q, at least as far as we know, then it's important for us as scholars to discipline our minds to say, well, what if the silence is significant? It might be insignificant. It might just be that this document was there and it got lost early on. You know, I mean, very careless of people to lose something so valuable, but um, it gets lost early on. And so what I say is, well, let's explore the possibility that the silence is significant. In other words, it's significant because maybe it never existed at all. Now, if when I investigated the possibility that Luke used Matthew, which is what I believe very strongly the evidence points to, if you believe that Luke knew Matthew, then that silence, that absence of Q becomes very important because there's just no reason to point to this document if the evidence is better explained without it. So that's what I call an argument about silence rather than an argument mm. from silence. I mean, I, I, I do really love Austin Farrer. I mean, he, he died when I was two years old, so I obviously never knew him. But one of my teachers, John Muddyman, who sadly died uh, in December, John Muddyman was one of Farrer's last students in Oxford in the 1960s. So I, I kind of feel like Farrer was almost like a scholarly grandfather um, to me. So even though I didn't know him, I got to hear a lot about him from my, it wasn't my only teacher that knew Farrer, but I got to hear about him from my teachers. And, and then when I found that article on Dispensing with Q, I thought this is just brilliant. So it's just a really important basic insight. So here's the way that Farah's mind works. He says that if you can make a good case that Luke is familiar with Matthew's gospel, then the need for Q evaporates. And what he does in his article is show that the case for Luke's familiarity with Matthew is actually very straightforward to make, and there really aren't any problems with it at all. And then Q just, just kind of vanishes in a puff of smoke, essentially. I mean, Q theorists today essentially argue that Matthew and Luke use Mark independently of one another. And if Matthew and Luke use Mark independently of one another, then you have to explain why they've got so many agreements that are not in Mark. So generally speaking, people don't worry too much about where Matthew and Luke are copying from Mark. And everybody agrees, or most people agree, that Matthew and Luke are copying Mark. I think that's the case as well. Mark and priority, that's called. But the problem comes in these 200 plus verses where Matthew and Luke agree with one another, but where it's not in Mark. And that has to be explained somehow. And so the Q theory says they were both copying independently from a source that's now completely vanished which we call Q for convenience. Q stands for the German Kvelle, which means source, you know. So that's really where the Q theory comes from. And, and really what my, my argument is, is that the evidence for Luke's familiarity with Matthew is just too strong for that. I mean, you have such close agreement between the two for starters. I wrote an article a few years ago called Too Good to be Q. The point being that where Matthew and Luke agree really, really closely, it makes much more sense to see one copying from the other rather than both of them copying from an unknown third source. And 
I would go on a step further than that to say that it's Luke that used Matthew rather than the reverse, because you keep finding interesting little elements of Mathean imagery, rhythm, Mathean theology, finding their way into Luke. So, you know, it, it, there's, I call them like Mathean fingerprints. Mathean fingerprints appear in, in Luke. So I think that it's clear that Luke has a copy of something mm. very closely approximating to Matthew's gospel. I, I haven't polled uh, New Testament scholars recently, but my sense is that the ground has really shifted in recent mm -hmm. years uh, on this question. And I think amongst those that study the synoptic problem carefully, um, I'm not sure that there is a majority of people that support the Q hypothesis. So there's still a lot of people that were taught it in grad school and haven't actually gone back and re-looked at, at the synopsis. But I basically hope that, that the ground is shifting you know, on this issue, but it seems to me that it is. More and more people seem to be open to the possibility that Luke knew Matthew. Um, with respect to scholars loving hypothetical sources and lost layers of tradition and so on, I have a theory about this, and this, this will sound just like pop psychologizing, but I'll, but I'll say it anyway. I think one of the things is, as scholars, especially as scholars of ancient history, one of the difficulties we've got is we haven't got enough information. We haven't got enough sources. And we're all in a way frustrated archeologists. We, we kind of, as textual people, we like looking over at the archeologist who any day might just discover another something really significant all the time in their digs, they're finding new stuff. So we like to think that we can be like the archeologists and dig down into text and find hidden layers and hypothetical sources. I'm skeptical about our ability to do that. Uh, I'm, mm. I'm not skeptical about the existence of lost layers of tradition and hidden sources and all the rest of it. I'm just really skeptical about our ability to, to find them. And I think the reason why scholars like them so much, these lost layers of tradition and so on, is that it empowers the interpreter. If, for example, when you're working with John's gospel, you can say, ah, oh, well, this is where John is manipulating his source and his source said this, but then the evangelist added that. Then as an interpreter, you, you've got that extra power to say, I know what the evangelist was really thinking because I have found his source material and I've shown how he changed it. But my sense when I read all of these different attempts to reconstruct lost documents and hidden layers of tradition, my sense is generally, I think that this is more in your imagination than it is in reality. I just don't think we have, in the nature of the case, the ability to dig out these lost layers of tradition. And it's even worse when you get to oral traditions. I mean, of course, there were oral traditions. Of course, people talk to one another. The question isn't that. The question is, how good are we at digging them out? I just don't, I just don't think the archaeological way of, look, of, of doing textual work is, is the right way. They actually go into depth about all of this. So if you want to hear more about which gospel copied from which gospel and how we know that, you should click on the link in the episode notes to hear the full conversation. For now, I'm going to direct us towards the gospel of Thomas. Dr. Goodacre goes against the prevailing views and thinks that the gospel of Thomas was influenced by early gospels instead of being an independent tradition. So, um, explain? When I looked at the Gospel of Thomas, and, and to be honest, when I began my research in the synoptic problem, I wasn't really looking at Thomas at all. So I, it, it was something I came to later. But instantly, when I looked at Thomas, I thought to myself, oh, my goodness, this is very clearly an author who is copying pieces from the synoptic gospels and combining them with his or her own new material. And, and you know, I mean, so, so in the gospel of Thomas, what happens is you get a synoptic saying and then a new saying that's not parallel in the synoptics and then a synoptic one and then a new one and then a synoptic one and then a synoptic one and then a new one. And you never go more than like two or three sayings without there being some bit of synoptic Jesus in there. And I realized as I read through Thomas that the case for Thomas's familiarity 
with Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's just really strong. So I used that term earlier on, Matthean fingerprints showing up in, in, in uh, Luke. Matthean fingerprints also show up in Thomas. So do Luke and fingerprints. So in other words, the way that Luke writes his characteristic phrases, the way that he redacts Mark and Matthew shows up in Thomas. And that's just impossible if Thomas was independent. So the idea of this independent gospel with this has this sort of pipeline to the earliest Christian sources, it's just, just to me um, doesn't work. So, so yeah, so my book, Thomas and the Gospels, is an argument that Thomas is familiar throughout with the synoptic gospels, very different from the synoptics in its theology of Jesus's relationship to Hebrew scriptures. It's quite explicit at one point where the disciples, and one of the new sayings, the disciples come to Jesus and they say, 24 prophets prophesied about you. And Jesus says, why are you talking to me about dead people when the living one is in your presence? And you're like, hmm. what? That's not the way Jesus talks in the synoptics. Right. In the synoptics, anytime that Jesus can, he will quote Isaiah. He'll, he'll quote different aspects of the of the Hebrew Bible. And if, if if you even look at the characters who appear in the in the Synoptic Gospels, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Isaiah, Jeremiah. I mean, th these names just, just, just keep coming up page after page after page. Now, look at Gospel of Thomas. How many figures from the Hebrew Bible do you find in there? Only one. And the only one is Adam. <laughs> so the thing is, that tells you something important. What it tells you is that like many Christians in the second century, the author of the Gospel of Thomas was rethinking the movement's relationship to the Hebrew scriptures. And like many other texts that we find in the second century, especially those that have been dug up in Nag Hammadi in 1945, they are obsessed with the first couple of chapters of Genesis. And so there, I mean, I sometimes joke about it that you get these Christians sometimes who do read the Bible in a year and they start at Genesis one and then they get to about Genesis six, they get to Noah's Ark and then they kind of give up. And I think that um, there were, there were some second century Christians, a little bit like that, that knew Genesis one to six really, really well. But then when it came to Jeremiah or Ezekiel, they, they really, uh, or, or for that matter, um, Leviticus or Numbers, I mean, they, they just, just didn't get that. Stuff. So I think that's the kind of writing that Thomas is, is deeply skeptical about Jesus's relationship to Israel's past. And I, and the thing is, I think there's been a reluctance among some scholars to acknowledge that, because if you're saying that the Gospel of Thomas is a good, authentic record of what the historical Jesus said, then you have a very different kind of Jesus from the Jewish Jesus of the Gospels. You know, so uh, you know, I think that's that's one of the things that's going on there. So there's been a resistance to acknowledging that the author of the Gospel of Thomas is just standing like. A lot of people in the second century, as they were kind of grappling with these things, stand in a fairly negative relation to Israel's scriptures. I think it's it's supposed to be a mysterious, enigmatic text, maybe a kind of a gateway text into mysteries that would have been explained more by wh whoever the teacher was who was who was uh, revealing these sayings, because. One of the things it keeps doing is it keeps talking about interpreting sayings. So you find salvation in Thomas by interpreting the sayings of Jesus, by thinking about them, meditating on them. So the whole thing begins with these are the secret words which the living Jesus spoke and which Didymus, Judas, Thomas wrote down. And then it goes on to talk about the one who finds the interpretation of them will not taste death. So it's a very different idea of salvation from the one that you get in the canonical gospels where basically the salvation is, is, is connected to the whole story of Jesus from birth to passion, or at least from ministry to passion. The gospel of Thomas, it's about listening, about listening to Jesus and listening to his sayings and so on. And incidentally, that's one of the reasons why 
a lot of contemporaries resonate with Thomas. One of the reasons why, why they like Thomas very much, because a lot of what people find unpalatable in the Gospels in a secular age is the attention to the miraculous and and and, and a story that ends with Jesus being raised from the dead. And then you look at the Gospel of Thomas and we don't have miracles. We don't have a resurrection. We just have Jesus saying stuff. And so I think for a lot of people, they just find it a much easier read than they do the synoptics and John. Are you familiar with some of these ideas or was this the first time you've ever heard of Q and the Gospel of Thomas? In the roundtable talk, Dr. Gruber and Dr. Goodacre cover so much more ground than I can highlight here. Click on the link in the episode notes to listen to the full talk. You can also listen to the IBC Hot Topics seminar called Why Are the Gospels So Different? And in that, you'll hear more background on the issues of the similarities and differences between the Gospels. If you want to join a whole online community taking a new look at the Bible, you are most welcome to join our community at israelbiblecenter.com. We have a huge collection of courses, and you can combine them and earn a certificate in Jewish context and culture. Thank you to Jeremy McDonald from Mason Jar Music for doing an amazing job mixing, editing, and crafting all the good sounds you hear. And thank you for hanging out with me and being curious about all things Bible-related. <laughs>